Thanks very much, Gib. Thank you to, uh, to Otmar and the other conference uh, op organizers. I'm delighted to be here. I appreciate the focus of this conference, uh, looking beyond uh, the effects of uh, carbon pricing simply on the climate system, but instead looking more broadly to things like competitiveness implications or implications for deficits and debt and thereby seeing how this broader vision might enhance political feasibility. And in keeping with that spirit, I am going to talk about how carbon pricing interacts with the tax system and explore how attending to these interactions might provide some windows of opportunity that can enhance political feasibility by getting the cost down. Um, so, Um, <clears throat> the um, connections between uh, emissions pricing and the tax system are reflected in uh, two uh, important uh, effects that um, uh, indicate the cost associated with these connections. One is the tax interaction effect, which is, um, you know, a carbon price, a tax on carbon is not simply a tax on carbon. To the extent, as any public economist will tell you, any public finance economist will tell you, all taxes are ultimately borne by factors of production like labor or reproducible capital or natural resources. And to the extent that happens, and there are pre-existing taxes on these factors, um, the environmental tax or the carbon price can exacerbate the distortions in those factor markets. That suggests a negative effect, but I'm going to sh mention in a moment how the tax interaction effect can also be uh, potentially beneficial. The other key effect is the revenue recycling effect. To the extent that carbon pricing, whether in the form of a carbon tax or cap and trade, raises revenue, those revenues can be returned to the economy uh, to finance cuts in pre-existing taxes and thereby lower the excess burden from those prior taxes. That's a beneficial effect. That can lower the cost of the policy. Uh, so these two effects seem to work in the opposite direction, but I want to mention that the tax interaction effect can also work t uh, toward efficiency. So when it is coupled with revenue recycling, the combination of the tax interaction and revenue recycling effect can shift the burden of taxes toward hitherto under tax factors and thereby improve the efficiency of the tax system and lower costs. And I'll give an example of that in a moment. So um, I think we can look at these tax interactions at two levels. We can explore the cost reductions at two levels. One is in the aggregate, and I'm going to start with that. Think about how you can uh, ex exploit tax interactions to lower uh, the costs overall relative to other policies. Um, in addition, perhaps a more ambitious goal would be to find a way to not only lower the cost, but have them become zero or negative. That's the double dividend uh, phenomenon. But we can also think about how tax interactions or exploiting them can be used to uh, lower the cost to particularly interested parties. So this is the more specific or disaggregated look. Uh, so you can look at how you can exploit these interactions to lower the cost to certain industries or to certain households. So let's um, start with the aggregate costs. I'll briefly mention that one way is, is uh, one can lower the cost uh, relative to other policies. If your reference point is a policy where you've introduced emissions pricing and you've returned the revenue in a lump sum fashion, well, you can lower the cost relative to that by using the revenues to finance marginal tax rates. That reduces the distortions by pre-existing taxes and can lower the cost relative to the case with lump sum. But what about the more, let's say, ambitious case? Uh, for many, it would be more exciting if we could actually cause the cost to disappear. That's the double dividend. Well, there's the literature, if you look through it all, there's many ways you can get the double dividend, but they all have something in common. There are two necessary conditions. One is that the initial tax system must be inefficient along some dimension other than the environmental dimension, other than the externality associated with greenhouse gas emissions. Um, <clears throat> so the environmental carbon pricing is also serving in some way to deal with some other dimension. And the second necessary condi condition, closely connected, is that the environmental tax policy reduces the inefficiency along this other dimension as well, and does it enough to create the double dividend. Now, it has to do it a lot because 
apart from this other dimension, you generally wouldn't want an environmental tax to improve the tax system. You wouldn't expect it to, because it's a much narrower tax, it has a narrower base. And generally, you can reduce the cost of the tax system by having a broad tax, like a broad income tax or a broad payroll tax. But if you can <clears throat> address some other inefficiencies in the tax system, you might be able to overcome the inherent handicap of uh, carbon pricing or environmental taxes, which is their relatively narrow base. So let's think about when you might be able to get this double dividend. And I'm going to mention a couple different ones, and several people in this room have done papers related to these different circumstances. One prior inefficiency might be in the relative taxation of capital and labor. If you have a system, for example, where the uh, initial tax system overtaxes capital, which appears to be the case in the US, for example, at least on efficiency grounds, and if the environmental t tax, the carbon tax, ends up being introduced in a way that shifts the burden from capital onto labor, thereby reducing that relative in, uh, uh, that in, uh, unevenness in taxation, you can get the double dividend. And the way this works is that the environmental tax introduces a tax interaction effect, which basically applies to both factors, but then if you recycle the revenues through cuts in labor taxes, sorry, cuts in capital taxes, you're, you're shifting the relative burden onto labor, and that can improve efficiency. Now, with my work with Lons Bovenberg, we only got it under some special circumstances where we assume very elastic capital, but I understand from talking with Warwick McKibben last night that in his model in Australia, he's been able to get the double dividend through this kind of um, channel, and it may have to do with the fact that in Australia, the capital flows, capital is relatively elastic, and the initial situation is one where capital is very highly overtaxed, and introducing the carbon and tax and using the revenue to cut labor taxes, uh, sorry, to cut capital taxes can create the double dividend. Another uh, situation uh, where you might be able to get it, again, you're starting with a pre-existing inefficiency where you have um, a very inelastic factor, namely resource rents, that aren't being sufficiently taxed relative to other factors. And um, Antonio Bento and Mark Jacobson have, a, uh, have looked at this in a paper in GEM from a few years ago. Atmar and his co-authors have a very recent working paper, and in both cases, they are able to get something like a double dividend by introducing, uh, again, the energy tax or the environmental tax, which through the tax interaction effect falls on all factors, but then if you use the revenues to cut uh, uh, taxes on the factors other than rents, you're shifting the burden onto rents, and you're improving the efficiency of the tax system. Uh, let me mention something about that. Um, I'm a bit skeptical about some of these results. Um, uh, if you think of a, um, in, in the, in the uh, of what is a carbon tax, it's, prime, it's often, to, to a large extent, it's a tax on coal. And in some countries, coal is still fairly elastic. Uh, the rents are not very high. I'm not sure we can really consider it a perfectly inelastic factor, which would be the most conducive to this. But then again, uh, in the US, uh, tax on coal is, is probably more of a rent tax because of the very inelastic supply of coal and the fact that it's basically constrained by the existing infrastructure. So I think it's going to depend a lot on the particular setting. Third example. I think a very important one is that we have in many countries, and just virtually all countries, an informal labor market. And in, as a result, in effect, you've got any unequal taxation. The informal labor ta market is being undertaxed by definition. How can you underdo, un, undo that? Well, suppose you put on an environmental tax like a carbon tax. Remember, the tax interaction effect means that the environmental tax is borne by all factors by raising the prices of goods and services. So that means it's basically returning the, it's reducing the return not only to factors in the formal labor market, but also in the informal one. And then if you use the revenues in this case to reduce taxes on labor in the formal labor market, again, you're shifting the burden onto the informal market and you're, you're helping reduce this inefficiency. And I think this is uh, quite important. Um, there's a paper by Marconda that looks at this and gets the double dividend in the case of Spain. In a, in a recent exciting paper by um, uh, Antonio, 
um, and his co-authors, they, uh, they find potential for a double dividend, even in the U.S. where the informal labor market is only about uh, 8%, I think, of, of, the, of the whole economy. Now, they only get the double dividend for relatively low uh, emissions reductions, like 4% or less, although they get what you might call an intermediate double dividend, that is, they lower the cost relative to partial equilibrium analysis for even larger emissions reductions. So I think this is quite exciting, and I know that they're starting to look at this in China and um, I think in India as well. Okay. What about, um, here's something that Ian Perry has mentioned uh, and brought out many years ago and recently been hounding me to take more attention, to pay more attention to. You've got, um, in the U.S. at least, certain kinds of consumer spending, namely on medical care and on housing, which is tax favored. Ian argues that that means there's an inefficiency in the relative taxation of, goods, uh, of consumer goods. If you introduce an environmental tax and use it to cut the income tax, you're essentially lowering the value of these subsidies to certain goods like housing and medical care and reducing that distortion. Ian thinks that there's a very strong potential for a double dividend in this case. This deserves a longer discussion. Maybe we'll have some of this during the break. I think there's some question of how you interpret this. Would we think of these taxes or these subsidies to housing and medical care as really distorting consumer choice or as dealing with some potentially beneficial externalities associated with those kinds of services or goods? I think that's a, there's, a, there's a question there. Okay. And then uh, Rob Williams and others, and by the way, forgive me, I'm sure there's lots and lots of other papers that are on these dimensions, but these are the ones that I, I have listed here. Um, if uh, improving environmental quality enhances labor productivity, that can offset what would otherwise be the negative effect on labor supply and can get you the double dividend. How does this all stack up? Well, different people have different views. I'd like to sort of su suggest three things. Number one is um, the double dividend is a possibility. I think it's going to depend on a lot of uh, the particular circumstances. In some countries, it might be more feasible than others. I don't think we should count on it. Um, I do think that there's a lot of promise, though, in this case of the informal labor market, and I think that's quite exciting. Secondly, even if we can't get the double dividend, it's exploiting these tax interactions or recognizing them can imply lower costs than you would otherwise think, and that can enhance political feasibility. And the third point is that something I often say is, even if it's a positive cost, no double dividend, so it's not a free lunch, it's still a lunch worth buying. Because, you know, every analysis will say that if you account for the environmental benefits, which up to now I've been ignoring, those will more than offset whatever costs on the non-environmental side remain. Okay, in my last three minutes, I want to talk about how you can exploit these interactions to lower costs to particular groups. The main mechanisms here are either inframarginal exemptions to either cap and trade or a carbon tax and revenue recycling. So how would you lower costs to particular industries? Under cap and trade, one way is through free allocation of allowances, because to the extent that you offer them free, you create rents, or, which can offset what, what otherwise would be a profit loss. And so the particularly vulnerable or mobilized industries might get on board. And this is something that has been pushed, uh, was something that was tried under the Waxman-Markey bill, and I think it does at least help uh, oil the squeaky wheels. Under a carbon tax, something analogous to that is inframarginal tax exemptions. They also create rents, even though there's much less discussion of that. It's really formally the same thing as giving free allowances under cap and trade. In both cases, you can actually boost profits. If you give too big an exemption or too much free allocation, the, the covered industries will actually have higher profits under regulation than they would without. So, but there is a trade-off, Otmar mentioned trade-offs. There is a sacrifice of efficiency because the more of these exemptions or free allowances, the less money you bring in, the less that you can recycle in the form of tax cuts to existing uh, taxes, and thus there's a, there's a, um, there's a trade-off. But the good news is, I'm gonna suggest that the sacrifice is small with the relatively small exemptions or small amounts of free allocation. You can make whole the industries that would otherwise be most vulnerable and uh, I think enhance political feasibility. There's some work that I've done with, um, with Mark Hafstead, who is a co-author, he's at Resources for the Future, uh, has suggested you only have to freely allocate in the U.S. Uh, less than 15% of the allowances under cap and trade to prevent a profit loss in the eight most vulnerable industries that would, um, would otherwise suffer significant losses under cap and trade.
Under both, another option is to use revenue to finance industry-specific tax cuts. Uh, once again, there's a trade-off with efficiency because you can't use this, uh, excuse me, that does not involve a trade-off because there's tax cuts involved. And then finally, uh, you can lower costs to particular households, either through lump sum rebates to those uh, particularly disadvantaged households. Um, this does entail a sacrifice of efficiency because um, you're not using the revenue to cut pre-existing taxes, instead you're giving it out in lump sum form. Um, but for many, this is very popular. It seems like it's a fair thing to do. Um, and here I'm gonna suggest, following Ian Perry's uh, lead, uh, some of his analytical work as well as some simulation work that I've done, here the efficiency sacrifice is large relative to what would be the case if you use the revenue to cut marginal tax rates. Some work in my simulation model suggests that under the, in the US, a $25 per ton carbon tax, the, um, the costs are about 30% higher if you rebate the revenue lump sum than if you rebate the revenue through cuts in the marginal rates of income taxes. Um, so I would favor the latter, at least on efficiency grounds, but there is an equity efficiency trade-off here. There may be reasons why it'd be hard to cut the marginal rates of some of the most disadvantaged, and therefore, in this case, you wanna uh, give it lump sum. So it, to find, in sum, in, or to conclude, I'm suggesting that the overall impacts of carbon pricing depend importantly on tax interactions. What counts is the nature of the pre-existing inefficiencies in the tax system, that's, um, as well as the nature of revenue recycling. And that if the uh, carbon pricing and combination of that with recycling can shift the burden onto previously under tax factors or under tax goods, uh, you can uh, get the double dividend or at least lower costs significantly. In some cases, we can discuss how rare they are, you can, you can get the double dividend and lower costs in the ag get zero costs in the ag aggregate. Again, even if you can't get zero costs by lowering them significantly relative to what you'd otherwise think, uh, you can enhance political feasibility. And finally, whether or not the aggregate costs are zero, I think there's a lot of potential for enhancing political feasibility also through um, targeted inframarginal exemptions under cap and trade or carbon tax or through targeted revenue recycling. Thank you.